Generative AI is overhyped, but I got a secret for you. It's also underhyped. How can two opposing viewpoints exist at one time? Let's think of Schrodinger's cat, right? Like that philosophical argument that multiple states can exist at one time. And it has a lot to do with your perspective, your knowledge, and how you want to look at things. Gartner loves these graphs, these trough of disillusionment, these expectations meeting reality. And generative AI is leading us right down into the trough of disillusionment. Why? I theorize with you because of things like ChatGPT, these transformer models, GPT, generative pre-trained transformer. Hi, how are you? And it comes back and it spits out so much text at one time. Give me a breakdown of how you work. Okay, and then boom, look, look, just at the speed of, you can't type that fast, you can't speak that fast, and it, it's incredible. And I don't think people understand, this is why GPUs are becoming more complex, more expensive, drawing more power to get information. And this is just the inference side of things. This isn't even all the training that OpenAI had to do to create this large language model with who knows how many parameters with all the weights and biases and all the calculations they have to go in. And I, I really love this transformer explainer. And I'll, I'll put a link to all these different references down in the description. But this is what a transformer model with these multi-head self-attention mechanisms look like. All of this, all of this, this is all linear algebra. This is math that is happening like that. And that's why GPUs are needed for things like this rather than a CPU. CPUs are serial processing, doing one calculation after another, whereas a GPU can do paralyzed, parallelized <laughs> calculations, and that means they can do multiple ones at a single time to get all of this, all of these words like that, and that is expensive. So when I look at this graph, it's ROI. Where is the ROI from all this investment that these businesses are doing for I cloud computing cost, on-prem cost, and everything in between of these hybrid models like Colos, GPU as a service. They want to know where it went. Why am I not getting my money back? And because of that, the perspective is that it's overhyped. But there are businesses that are putting the appropriate mechanisms, policies, procedures in place that are finding it underhyped and they're continually investing. And that's what we're seeing in the market. I think it has a lot to do with this. I think the stubbing your toe, the misunderstanding of artificial intelligence to the fault of, I think, some machine learning engineers, data scientists who are building these models because they didn't really outline how these things are actually put in place. It starts up here. This domain expertise, I would put them in the biggest font possible. These large language models or these other generative AI models that are imputed into a business heavily depend on those within the domain expertise bubble here to provide the appropriate input because the appropriate use cases for imputing generative AI models into your business start there with all the processes mapped out. That way you can actually see if there's measurable differences between the use of generative AI versus not. And how do you find these use cases? Well, there's got to be some sort of bottleneck or otherwise the ability to augment the output. So like a simple ROI can be anything that's customer facing. When you have like a customer service agent that can have quick access to information from some sort of chat bot and they can then service multiple customers at the same time or the output is twice as much, three times, whatever, 5X, then you see the output. You can have one person there instead of five people servicing that many people. That's an easy ROI. It's these internal use cases that become ever more difficult to quantify. And again, the domain expert really has to lead that conversation. But then once you do that, especially the more like internal employee experience, uh, internal processes, how do you measure it? Well, I really love this study that was put out there by the Harvard Business Review and Boston Consulting Group in collaboration with MIT, University of Pennsylvania and Harvard Business School wrote this, navigating the jagged techn technological frontier, field experimental evidence of the effects of AI on knowledge, worker productivity and quality. This was approached like a scientific study where you have a control group and then some experimental groups. And in this instance, Boston Consulting Group was able to segment about 7% of their workforce with defined scopes of work with appropriate KPIs of measurement. One group, the control group, no artificial intelligence. Just go about your business as you normally would, 
There was another group, hey, we're gonna give you access to a generative AI LLM. You're gonna be able to access it and then all your work output has to be brought forth from that AI model. And then another third group with additional training to further take advantage of all the enhancements that come with using a generative AI model. I won't go and I'll, I'll put all the links in the description. I won't go too far and this is a September 2023 model. And I still think it's kind of the, the best practices, creme de la creme, state of the art, as far as how you should look about measuring ROI within your business. Now, what came about this? So the total 7% or 758 consultants from Boston Consulting Group were evaluated in the jagged technological frontier. So this is this kind of hypothetical world of the appropriate usage of artificial intelligence. So within inside of the frontier, those are good, valuable use cases. Outside of the frontier, not so much. So inside of the frontier, they found upwards of 12.2% increase of tasks performed using AI, and uh, the completed tasks were increased by 25.1%, produced signif uh, significantly higher quality results, more than 40% higher quality compared to the control group. Again, control group wasn't using artificial intelligence. Consultants across the skills distribution benefited significantly from having AI augmentation with those below the average performance threshold increasing by 43% and those above increasing by 17% compared to their own scores. Uh, for a task selected outside the frontier, however, consultants using AI, AI were 19 percentage points less likely to produce correct solutions. And if because they weren't able to produce correct solutions, they otherwise were less productive. One set of consultants acted as centaurs, like the mythical half horse, half human creature, dividing and delegating their solution creation activities to the AI or to themselves. Another set of the consultants acted more like cyborgs, completely integrating their task flow with AI and continually interacting with the technology. So it was very, very well put together to measure the performance and ROI. And these were like more internal tasks, not thing that's customer facing or not something that is easily quantifiable as far as the return on investment. I did some further digging based on more learning that Boston Consulting did. And I, I found it really fascinating. So one of the things like inside the frontier, the ability to use like an LLM plus RAG model, which is retrieval augmented generation, to put in documents and share across the more experienced consultants and the more younger consultants. How fast can we get these younger consultants up to speed in order to get them to be more productive, customer facing, and thereby get more money back into the consulting firm. What was interesting in some of those interviews was that even the ones that are considered inside the frontier, like that is an inside the frontier utilization of an LLM, can turn into something that becomes outside the frontier where you start giving a negative ROI. Because what was happening, potentially, in some pockets, was that AI became a crutch. It was giving information, especially to the newer workers, but they weren't learning. They were just kind of copy and pasting, applying, rather than really studying, really conceptualizing the knowledge that was output from these LLMs in order to further their education. And then that way it could be distilled into their brain. And then that way they would become more effective in the long term, hopefully using the LLMs and generative AI models. In this case, it was GPT-4 less because every time you got to go back to the AI, then that's going to take time rather than if you actually just know the model and it's distilled into your memory. So responsible AI is another thing that's come about with all this and the ethics and the bias and everything else that you should be aware of when putting a model into your business, because something could quickly turn from a great use case, a great ROI into a negative ROI. If you don't fully understand with the collaboration, leading with the domain experts within a given area, and the machine learning engineers, some sort of responsible AI arm that understands both parts of the business and can talk you through the cause effects, the long-term effects, how you impute this in your process, what to watch out for, what the future state could potentially look like. It, it, it's a lot to understand and we're all learning together, but this area is incredibly fascinating. Yes, it's overhyped, but it's also underhyped. And once we get through that, once we start, you know, we stub our toe a little bit and we'll, we will come out on the other side. And again, this will just be another 
another part of our daily life, just like the internet is, and we will be better for it. So just be aware again, everything that I talked about, all these different resources, I'll put links in the description and just hope you learn from it and save a buck or two, but also earn a buck or two.